So hello everybody. Uh, I'm happy to and welcome to the final talk of the series, Regeneration and its Discontent. Uh, I think uh, I can be honest and say that I never expected to end the series talking to the screen of my computer. Uh, the plan was to meet at the National Gallery of Art for a talk, uh, and uh, then a sound walk, and finally head to the closing party. However, plans do change, but I see this an opportunity rather than a loss. Mm, I also didn't expect to say that the series will end in a different world. For some, these differences are just minor, uh, they are just barely felt while for others uh, they can be life-changing and they are. I think the whole series tried to give a closer look at these different scales of uh, different impacts that uh, different urban transformations have. For a very long time, uh, discourse of gentrification a uh, discourse of identification offered binarities and uh, fake promises of prosperity, while state-led uh, uh, regeneration process imposed different set of promises, but it, discontents were all too obvious. And one of these, oh, one of the main focus of the series was art's role in the process of regeneration, and as Jasper Josef Lester noted last week, art an artist became another resource, uh, a last minute cry for help by municipalities and developers, or as Anthony Illis and Anna Vilenica presented, art inhibited both sides of imaginary barricades, giving tools of resistance for inhabitants as well as becoming tool in real estate developer schemes. However, I believe artistic practices can become not only a tool, but it can offer a new way of perceiving the city and its architecture. And I think sound can offer a fresh perspective on the city and especially on the architecture. So before introducing our guest today, I want just to say that um, the series, talk series end, ends, but we will have a publication following the series. And you also can find all the records uh, of the talks in Architecture Fund's website. So check that if you missed previous ones. And today I'm very happy to present Bono Chichek Tulu and Samuel Peria Diaz and, and their lecture. So thank you very much for joining and uh, welcome. So, hi. <laughs> now I think everybody see us. Uh, we're gonna share our screen and you're gonna see our uh, presentation. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. One moment. Yeah. So, uh, if there is any uh, technical thing, please let us know. I guess it works with the chat uh, option. Um, so good evening, good, uh, good, good evening, right now it's not afternoon, good evening everyone and uh, uh, first of all thank you uh, the curatorial team uh, for the invitation, uh, this, um, uh, this talk was meant to be in, in, in Vilnius in March, um, but we are happy to be online and being with you and um, thank you also like all the technical um, um, details and also the, all the conversations that have happened till today. Uh, today we will give uh, an introduction to um, sound related topics uh, within the architecture, urban space and uh, how we as architects, urban designers and artists uh, can benefit from sensing the aural uh, in our living environment. Our presentation is part of our ongoing research project together. Uh, we will give an introduction on how to conceive uh, and analyze the built environment through the sounds in urban space and the notion of listening as a bodily action. We are going to create a narration between different disciplines inside sound studies that includes acoustic ecology, soundscape, auditory perception, psychoacoustic, and musical composition. Um, 
And also this narr narration includes um, our work, of course, as well as the work of other practitioners uh, that we were, uh, or we are still influenced by them from literature to, to sound art, from music to architecture and, and urban design. Uh, and also shout out to all, uh, to all of uh, our students uh, who are very eager and working very hard every semester and we learn from that, them uh, a lot. And this is an interdisciplinary topic in which uh, we engage our professional background, artistic practice and teaching uh, at the university. Uh, in this talk, what we would like to share with you uh, as well are ongoing methods. Uh, at the end of the talk, uh, uh, we would like you to get an idea about uh, our work, be more aware of uh, your sound environment, uh, and hopefully integrate or use sound uh, in your projects. So let us get a bit of information about us. We are both uh, independent researchers with background in urban design and architecture based in Berlin. We are both currently teaching a seminar called Berlin Sonic Auditory Collective Inspiration at the Humboldt University. Uh, for us, sound is not only a signal, but a spectrum or vibrational form that includes the social, the cultural, and the political. Our work consists of practice-based projects that span from workshops and site-specific interventions. We aim to include with them human perception of spaces and how to navigate them through sounds which is our primary interest medium. As we mentioned before, we work with interdisciplinary research methods, which are based on studies about participation, public space, sonic urbanism, sonic environment, acoustic ecology, collective listening, auditory diagramming, environmental special justice, and urban activism. Uh, continue talking, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Samuel and I have background in architecture. During the last year, I was collaborating with different cultural institutions, curators, artists, designers, and architects between different cities that include Sevilla, Bar Barcelona, London, and Berlin. I started researching audio forms during my architecture degree and continue during my studies in the program sound studies. Um, at the University of the Arts in Berlin. My art practice is concerned with uh, observing and acting uh, between the interplay of memory and history. My site-specific artworks set contextual data over the actual environment, sounding sonic structures with different mixed media, including virtual reality. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my name is Banu. I have a background uh, in urban design and art. Uh, I am currently a PhD candidate um, at the Fine Arts uh, University Hamburg. Uh, in art practice, um, I focus on mostly practice-based approach and my artistic uh, projects um, include the social field and social fields that and areas of knowledge focusing on critical discourse, gender studies, feminism, uh, critical theory, and so on. Um, this, this much to do, uh, I guess the practice-based approach is much to do with my background. Um, and I, um, I include um, most of the time um, participation and activism to, into my artwork. Uh, at the same time, uh, from the early um, early ages, I was into music. In the last years, uh, I was also including DJing techniques, for example, into my projects as an as an alternative tool. Uh, my studies and uh, my uh, artistic um, interests got together, and I started my PhD, where I work uh, uh, in the intersection of design theory, sound studies, and participation. Uh, in the following sections, uh, I will give more insights about my academic research, but basically I do dedicate myself uh, to the topics related sound in urban urban space. Um, if, there, if there are more questions, I can, uh, I'm happy to answer them at the end of the talk. So we think uh, there is a big potential in searching uh, sound in architecture and urban design practice. 
The architecture discipline overall needs to provide itself with more resources in order to enrich the dimension of sound. But how can sound contribute to understanding the built environment? What are the methodologies that foster sound as a participatory tool for us? In the book, The Eyes of the Skin, Architecture and the Senses, first published in 1996, the architect uh, Johanny Palasma explored a theory of fully embodied and sensory architecture. In his own words, he wrote, we are not normally aware of the significance of hearing in spatial awareness. Architecture is the art of reconciliation between ourselves and the world, and this mediation takes place through senses. What we can anticipate here, and uh, we are going to see next, are projects that generate spaces in the inter interstice between architecture and sound. There are examples of cross-disciplinary approach to sonic scenes and bodily perception of a space. Yeah, mm. so as Samuel uh, highlighted, we use all of our senses in our daily, uh, in our daily, um, daily life. And uh, in our interest in working with sound, we start um, our projects uh, asking this question. Are you listening? Uh, this question uh, belongs to Paulino Oliveros, who is an American composer and female uh, key figure in the development of experimental electronic music. Uh, she formulated the term deep listening uh, to describe a practice of radical attentiveness. Uh, in her practice, listening is an inherently empathetic bodily act. Uh, Oliveros uh, is an important figure for us. Uh, we appreciate her work a lot uh, and adopt her methods and techniques about hearing and listening attentively in, in our projects. So um, you can see a quote of Oliveros from her book, Deep Listening uh, from 2005. Uh, Oliveros words already reflect the engagement with sound and memories. So in this point, um, let's go back. Uh, in this point, we, uh, we would like you to uh, just take a moment and ask yourself, uh, how far do you think that you have been a listener? And what is your first sonic memory? Um, is it possible to remember that? Can you remember that? So here another um, uh, another quote uh, from Oliveros, as we can uh, anticipate here already, hearing and listening is one of the most important human skills to understand and experience in everyday life. Listening is a, a common practice that we all we all do. We all observe our common environment sonically. But coming back to the architectural dimension of our presentation, when the curators asked us for something worthy reading, we decided on these two books because they are both crucial on theories about sound and space. On one hand, Murai Shafa extensively touches upon the idea of soundscape. And on the other hand, Barry Blazer and Linda Ruth Salter related to architecture covering the acoustic of the built environment. And both separately or together are a phenomenological study of the built environment from the perspective of uh, urban and architecture theory. First, we would like to talk briefly about the book Spaces Speak, Are You Listening? Experiencing Our Architecture, in which the author outlines auditory aspects of uh, architecture space as a aural architecture, which refers to the property of a state that can be experienced by listening. The book offers the reader a broader context of aurality, auditory spatial awareness, aural arts, and musical spaces. The author continuously suggests understanding the aural architecture of different spaces. For example, on a highway, one can feel unsafe and stress it because of the noise. In a concert hall, uh, 
or in the dance floor, one can feel dynamic and excited because of the music, or, mu or maybe in a religious space, one can feel safe or just calm because of the silence or the reverberation of the space. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is... Um, this is our yeah. We can post. And um, the second book was uh, the famous soundscape, um, Our Sonic Environment and the Tuning of the World by Murai Schaeffer. It is one of the, um, one of the most important uh, works on theory of soundscape. Uh, Murai Schaeffer is a musician, composer, and former uh, um, professor from Canada, uh, suggests that we try uh, to hear the acoustic environment as a musical composition, and further that we, uh, uh, we own responsibility for its composition. Like many issues emerging from the explosion of ideas uh, in the late 60s, he was uh, mainly concerned about the noise pollution. Uh, However, uh, all, later he has been also criticized uh, not appreciating the sound of, of the cities. Um, all, all of us uh, in daily life experience sound in a, in a negative way as noise pollution, or we focus only the, the, the pollution, I mean, the noise pollution. Um, while the cities became more um, more dense, the machine use increased. There were there was a critical turn on sound ecology. So in that sense, Sheffer states that ecology um, is the study of the relationship between living organisms and their environment. Uh, for this, the author introduced a new uh, terminology: acoustic ecology, sounds in relationship to life and society. So you cannot really separate. Um, the sound from uh, em your environment and the society. Uh, ac acoustic ecology uh, focuses on the effects of the acoustic environment or soundscape and the physical, physical responses or behavioral um, characteristics of the, um, of the users. Sheffer's response to the problem um, was develop range of ear cleaning exercises, including sound bolts, uh, evoking meditation where the object is to maintain a high level of sonic awareness. So this uh, brings us um, to another important figure, uh, Hildegard Westerkamp, who is also composer, radio artist, and sound ecologist. And she is the person who founded the Soundwalk method. And Soundwalk is basically uh, listening carefully while walking. There are um, different ways to do sound walk individually or collectively, uh, and uh, but we are mostly um, interested in the collective and participatory approach of sound walk. So here you see uh, this talk going to continue uh, as we pre present our methods and uh, talking about sound walk. The first method is is the sound walk. Um, uh, but in that sense, um, we also ask the question, how does sound walk contribute to urban research? What is the relation uh, between sound and the research in urban spaces? Uh, using actually one of our senses, hearing eventually, uh, also listening at the same time. In other words, uh, analyzing the, the urban space with other senses rather than just focusing on the visual, uh, visual or the, the, the surrounding. Uh, for example, here you can see um, some pictures from the sound box uh, that we organized. Uh, those pictures are from the Design Museum in Munich last year. Um, so uh, for us, sound walk is, is definitely a multidisciplinary and qualit uh, qualitative approach uh, through walking in which listening becomes the primary source of information. Um, it is an active, dynamic and critical performance uh, which the rhythms guide the participants through the selected area to discover and produce acoustic uh, territories. Uh, at the same time, uh, because of 
the collective approach, uh, this method becomes a participatory act in, in our projects uh, when we work in, in urban space. Uh, we always um, try to find ways to include soundwalk as one of our methods. And we try different ways in soundwalk, but the main idea stays in walking and, and listening. Sonic uh, Mind Maps uh, is the second method that we present today to you. Uh, it's structured by a workshop which consists first of a sound walk, as Pan explained, and concludes with a collective sonic map. This ongoing research project is called Rhythm Encounters, which we already perform in different countries and locations from academic to art festivals. In in a game format, Rhythm Encounter is based on approximately 90 minutes of critical listening exercises. Participants explore their surrounding sounds using attentive listening and audio diagramming techniques while considering its social and cultural context. What you can see here is a summary of three selected different workshops. The first one performed in a semi-open uh, outdoor space in the transition of three courtyards in Berlin the second one took place in a closed area inside of one of the buildings at the Technical University campus as square well in Berlin, that we will take a look closer later. And the third one performed in the public space around the Technical University in Vienna. Mm -hmm. What you can see here in these slides, uh, we always give participants uh, a workshop kit, which includes a map a map, of, a map of the area and we invite the group to hear and mark different our location using stickers. They make uh, sketches or write down the characteristic of the sonic environments individually. The process engages them to include what they think about the overall sound environments of the marked location, adding as well adjectives and feelings. After 30 minutes notation and listening exercises, we come together and reflect on, que on questions such. Uh, is it possible to measure space with sound? Uh, can the repetitions help us to create alternative cartography? If yes, how social, cultural, and political rhythms shape our everyday life? Also, we explored uh, this urban game using portable sound devices together with more abstracts, uh, maps to navigate on. To get some impressions, this sounds like this. You are starting the auditory diagramming. Please start walking. Please pay attention to the sound of people. Please pay attention to the sound of people. So that sounds like that. And as, um, as you can imagine, Rhythmic Encounters uh, has been as well adapted to, uh, uh, I mean, adapted as a, as a digi digital intervention due to the current situation and restrictions on, on outdoor meeting and acti uh, activities in, 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 in groups. Uh, the online adaptation uh, uh, facilitates um, the participants to hold material, as you can see here, uh, that they can use individually or self-gathered uh, small groups in that up. And uh, there is an abstract map that can be easily downloaded and printed, uh, which can adapt to any city or any any area. Um, after uh, after downloading, they can follow the instructions and include their annotations uh, and. Uh, co after completing uh, the task, they can send us uh, an email with the results. So uh, we collect all the abstract maps, which have been manipulated by different people, and create a collab col uh, collaborative uh, result. And this way, it becomes an analysis tool, which we very much uh, needed in in urban design processes. So, yeah. 
just have a look at some samples. In this workshop, we started visiting the site-specific work of Bernhard Leitner. This is a permanent sound art installation in a corridor of the university uh, that has been running every day since 1984. After that visit, we continued doing uh, the workshop uh, in the central indoor courtyards of the same building using um, this map. Like the other workshops, uh, this one is a structure within a drawing uh, of the area to explore and round stickers and written commands. After uh, 25 minutes of listening and writing down individual impressions, uh, there is a collective um, discussions where the participants talk all together about the different stages of the listening section. For example, we encourage them, uh, asking them to share the impacts of the sonic encounters they had, as well inviting them to share their personal, the personal uh, impressions. Here we can see closer the blank map that we provide in the beginning of the workshop that basically is the architectural plan of the area to perform with. And here a movie of the 18th individual inputs. And now what we see here is the last step of our workshop, this colorful collage derived from sonic experiences. It is an overlayer sensory cartography that we created with all individual maps. Some days later, after the workshop, we send an email to all participants with uh, the collective collage. Because also we think that this object becomes a visual written memory filled with sonic perceptions. So we're gonna show you some uh, impressions, some pictures from different locations and workshops. Um, every time we realize this workshop, uh, the context is different. Uh, and uh, as well, the participants coming from uh, different backgrounds, uh, working with different fields that are related to architecture, urban design or art, or not related and they participate with their own knowledge and experiences in, in, in the urban space. And because of this reason, the results uh, differ, and this brings a lot of, um, yeah, <laughs> a lot of uh, diversity to, to our approach. We were really looking forward to do that in Vilnius also, and hope, we hope that uh, we, would, uh, we would realize in the, in the near future. Um, and yeah. So we believe that also this kind of individual collective listening exercise can be uh, used uh, as an analysis tool for urban design practice. Instead of, um, instead of sitting in a table interviewing or serving the inhabitants, such, such a method uh, can create a collective understanding of the urban space uh, through sound. Uh, while helping to improve um, the sonic conditions of that area. So uh, let's, uh, yeah, this is also, as you see, <clears throat> is the last part, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is the last part of the uh, workshops. We put here all together to compare, like <clears throat> you can see already the differences between the number of participants mm -hmm. intensity for writing down inputs for selected workshops. Yeah. So um, this, uh, to give it um, a bit of, of the um, theoretical background, creating mind maps um, comes from the well-known study of Kevin Lynch, the image of the city, uh, where he was uh, using behavioral, uh, uh, behavioral geography as an analysis of the public space. Uh, what we do differently from Kevin Lynch is that we include sonic perception and create this sonic mind maps. Um, so make it uh, more understandable. Seeing and sounding are different, um, as we all know. <laughs> the, vis uh, the visual what we see is analytical and reflective. Uh, 
at, and on the other hand, sounding is active and generative. Uh, and acoustic space is, in that sense, simultaneous, simultaneous field of relations, and uh, the sound is actually a, uh, is the presence resonating with the, the hu human uh, sensorium. So what I am hearing maybe is not the same as what you hear. Uh, while the visual is not necessarily the presence, does not have to uh, cover the presence at also. Um, in that sense, focusing on different senses while analyzing the urban space uh, is crucial for us um, in, in our work. Um, another, um, uh, another background is uh, when we especially focus on rhythms of the city, which we adopt from Lefebvre's famous work, Rhythm Analysis. Uh, with the sonic dimension, we uh, try to take the rhythm analysis one step further and focus deeply on, on the bodily, uh, bodily perception. Uh, rhythm analysis, as you might know, Lefebvre's last work, where the author emphasizes the importance of temporality. Uh, he offers a way of thinking and doing uh, research that makes us um, aware of time and space in new ways. Um, in that book, Lefebvre demonstrates um, how space um, and time need to be brought and taught together to better understand the, the everyday life. And at the same time, he doesn't think that uh, rhythms exist um, outside of our embodied perception. It is not that, that there are rhythms that we can measure through instruments uh, or tools. Uh, so for the author, our body is the instru uh, instrument uh, of our research. And we guess that um, is exactly what we are doing um, in the Rhythmic Encounters workshops. So to um, conclude this section, uh, we want to summarize a bit and what we were what we were talking about. Also, if people join later to talk, they can follow us better, maybe. Um, first of all, we believe that these two methods, sound walk and sonic mind maps, can help uh, to discover the relation between the urban space and the sound environment. By adapting sound with a participatory approach, these methods can be helpful to discover sonic territories and sonic experiences of the residents or the users. And uh, then they can be used as an analysis and help with um, decision-making processes. Um, we as professionals can design in a way to identify the architectural elements, compositions, or interventions of urban space that contribute to the shape and the character of its, uh, its sound environment. First of all, um, taking into account the human perception, of course, and maybe with different material use or, or small sound interventions. Uh, and in, in research, these two methods, they can determine uh, whether the sound can be considered as a uh, relevant element in urban design and to what extent um, would be a critical agent in the spatial, par uh, spatial participatory and qualitative uh, research tool of urban spaces and uh, their assessments uh, by the users. We are good in time. Yeah. Yeah. So we are going to present now quickly different uh, examples from architects and artists that we think that sound has been used as a participatory tool. This kind of project includes influence us quite a lot. Uh, there are different approaches to how sonic forms can foster participation and interaction in the public space. Uh, in this project, Studio Morada Vaga, that is a collective by Pedro Cavaco and Manfred Eckley, directly or indirectly, they work quite attentively with sonic objects and sonic spaces. In particular, in this intervention in Portugal, the performative, performative objects uh, create these narratives resonating memories or storytelling with the scene of a giant squid. Studio Morada Vaga took inspiration from the rich sea life 
that exist in and around the Atlantic to produce to produce a site-specific piece um, of interactive art. Mm -hmm. The song intervention highlights the aspect of communication in the process of participating with both sounding and listening. In that way, the interaction with the environment is an exercise of sending and receiving through the reciprocal action of different public. Just uh, get an impression of the sonic dimension of the intervention and play a short video. So, you know, that's if you experience that, it makes your day, day happy, I guess. Um, let's have a, a look uh, to uh, another project, uh, another approach, totally different scale, uh, created by Karsten Seipfart. Von Hören has been interested uh, in specific local uh, conditions and urban issues, making connections to sound and listening since, uh, since 2015. Uh, this project happens in Bonn, a city with an extensive industrial production history and now is the hub of business. Uh, so it is this classic German city, public space use has been uh, shrinking since years and Bonn Hören interestingly appoints um, a city sound artist every year to create uh, sound work uh, all around the city of Bonn. Uh, the works vary from sound installations to performative interventions um, uh, and they invite the public to understand urban space through, through sound. Uh, those kind of uh, new projects on sound in cities help users to uh, discover the um, acoustic properties of urban spaces that possibly they never, uh, they never realized. Uh, and there are collaborations between institutions, local government, uh, municipality, and the artists, like uh, let's say new, um, um, uh, new collaborations. Um, and they lead us to think about the sonic possibility of, of the user's performance within the notion of openness, uh, the public, and the civic place, uh, which are topics always in, uh, in discussion at the, at the urban level. So uh, this slide and the, the, the previous slide uh, is the, the work of uh, Sam Agne, uh, first sound artist in residence in Bonn Hören. Uh, the artist produced a map uh, that sonically explains different acoustic spaces, looking at uh, different urban areas um, around the city. Uh, with this map, Agne invites the public to experience um, the acoustic characteristics uh, of different locations of the city, focusing on scale, uh, dimension, reflection, reverberation, as well as the material uh, in use. Um, it is a mind opening project um, because on one hand, using the sound in various scales, they create a space for participation and interaction using, uh, using sound. On the other hand, it proposes an alternative cartography and challenges the mainstream urban design practice. So, mm -hmm. to continue talking about um, art practices now, 
we are going to share examples from our own practice and which is the third method that we present today to you. With these projects, we conceive uh, how a space can be defined as a relational narration that engages sonic participation um, what we were saying before, sounding and listening. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is um, this is uh, one of my last artwork, which has been exhibited at Alta Nova Gallery, Gallery Futura, uh, last month. Uh, also postponed because of the current situation, but we realize it finally. Um, the group, uh, it was a group exhibition which was focusing a feminist perspective for Berlin and collecting proposals. What could a non-sexist city look like? Uh, it is a multi-channel sound installation where I work on a very common issue, uh, street harassment uh, towards women, LGBTIQ, migrants, BIPOC and, and people with disabilities. Uh, I was mainly criticizing the notion of Benjamin's learner because walking uh, can be a challenging act for those groups that I already uh, mentioned. Uh, the installation combines recordings of my heartbeat, steps and breathing, showing the reaction of my body. So you can actually hear now. So um, there were, I explained a bit the installation. So there were six uh, different speakers with different sounds. One, you get close or enter this uh, round shape uh, structure with your head. Uh, you start hearing the sounds separately, but they become one single track uh, because of your perception. So I wanted the, the audience to feel my body and the sonic reaction of my body. Um, with this, um, let's say, sonic work, I wanted to create um, awareness of such visible problem, which I call sonic violence, uh, which our privileges sometimes uh, doesn't let us to realize, or we don't really realize uh, what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in everyday life. And uh, the interesting, I got a lot of questions from the audience, rather they could hear sonic violence, during the during the installation and contrary the, the 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 installation does not consist of sonic violence it rather proposes a safe space during the experience with a, a meditative and rhythmic sound composition so mm -hmm. um exploring mechanism of uh, surveillance um this artistic intervention on the public space emphasizes the ordinary perception of board on borders of control. This work refers to a specific historical surveillance space which was located in the male toilets in Hamburg in the 80s in order to control encounters in public toilets. This historical incident was signalized by the intervention of queer activists by breaking the glass of the panoptic panoptic rooms. I got very impressed by this action and created a sonic intervention in the building of the Academy of the Arts in Berlin, referring to this historical act um, to refer to the political dimension of sexual encounters. This performative sound sculpture is a six channel composition 
composition that consists um, on free recording of the ventilation system from the male toilets locating in the underground of the building. The recorded sounds are computer processed and collective spatialized by hidden loudspeakers below the round surveillance glasses. The sound of this intervention combined the sounds of the ventilation of the building while relocating and positioning them in the outdoor completes and creates the piece. Sounding architectural elements uh, is an ongoing research uh, in my practice. For example, this intervention uh, plays with the notion of uh, the aesthetic experience as a medium. It proposed to explore human identity through the perception of sounds. This piece is a sonic installation which is located on a 10 meters long wall. The installation invites the audience to explore the existing sound environments while paying attention to the new sonic textures that emerge as a background sound. Let's listen a little bit. The sound is um, generated uh, electronically using personal information of each uh, locker's owner. For that, I use uh, finger recognition techniques to create a notation of the personal data. Um, in that way, it, way each participant's uh, finger biometric characteristics have been classified and converted into sonic textures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you... Um... As you see, the topics uh, we are working on uh, related to our everyday experiences, they are related to society, mostly minorities, and also, also very political. Uh, we believe uh, the power of sound, uh, which plays a crucial role uh, in creating, uh, uh, the, creating the political um, uh, imagination. Uh, coming back to the, the problem of the sonic violence, this project is a workshop series um, I was doing for the last two years. Uh, and it aims to create a platform where um, there is a learning process about the sonic violence, uh, sonic memory and analysis of the sonic archives of the participants, as well as uh, the exchanging the strategies towards the, uh, the sonic violence. Uh, when we talk about uh, sonic violence, one of the most common protection isolation from its uh, uh, from it is is using headphones. Uh, even one can uh, one can hear at least pretend like um, uh, not hear anything. So uh, the workshop starts with an introduction and uh, and follows the uh, follows with a sound walk. After that, um, participants are invited to to create different, uh, different headphones with recycled materials. These headphones are provocative rather than, than it's aesthetic. 
And here I also play with the idea of design that I believe that it's a po it's political provocative, it sexualizes, it colonial colonialized and manipulates and and segregates. Uh, so with this uh, with, uh, the DIY uh, uh, design headphones, the project uh, initiates a conversation on sonic violence with and for women, LGBTQI, and communities with, uh, with migrant backgrounds. As we already mentioned several times, hearing and listening are totally different notions. Um, working with both this phenomena is challenging, but at the same time can teach us and the and the, the the participants or the group that you are working, the the the, the idea of uh, Paulino Oliveros atten attentive listening, which can have a great impact on us in terms of creating awareness, understanding different perspectives, and enhancing our political uh, imagination. Here are some pictures of objects that we were creating together. As you can see. They are very provocative and bring also the question of uh, why do we use headphones in, in our daily life? So you can see. Okay. Time. So we are in the last part of our presentation. And our understanding of sonic exploration can be understood as an alternative and interdisciplinary teaching tool, discovering urban space through sounds. For that, we wanted to introduce our teaching experience, Berlin Sonic Auditory Collective Explorations. Um, it's a seminar in the Berlin Perspectives module at the Humboldt University Berlin. The aim of the course is allowing international students to explore urban space in a new city through sound, to gain a strength, a strength and to develop knowledge and individual perspective um, <clears throat> while including their own disciplines into the discussion. Coming from different backgrounds, the students explore the urban space with the possibility of use sound as a learning tool. The course is structured in topics as burning city of sounds, techno music, architecture of sounds, urban listening, walking as an aesthetic practice, sonic cartography, archiving city sounds within field recordings, exploring Berlin individual and collective favorite sounds or examples of sound art in public space. We invite local and international artists to share with us their practices. For example, here we can we can see some online talks with Katrin M, Nick Novak, Peter Kusak, or Dimitri Hegemann. Like where we invite the other artists as Georg Klein and Hans Peter Kuhn. Uh, the course also includes uh, architectural visits, excursions, listening sections, and sound works as we visit the, the Berlin Philharmonic or exploring the acoustic dimension of Tempelhof Airport with the artist uh, Sam Einger. Mm -hmm. so these are our students. At the end of the semester, students realize an individual or group work in the form of written or audio papers, sound compositions, sound collage, sound works, or performances in relation to, to the city. Hmm? Yeah, so um, we now at the end of our presentation, and we would like to sum up a bit. Uh, let's have a look kind of um, important points that we reflected on during the talk. First of all, we see sound as an analytical tool. We believe that we can create sonic pedagogy. As we shared during the last part of our talk, we perceive sound as a pedagogical resource to explore the sonorities in the urban space and intermediate uh, sonic spaces. Uh, it can uh, it can foster, uh, foster further exploration of the oral culture from the perspective of urban studies, um, architecture and art, and could be a proposal for alternative pedagogy and education. 
In an interdisciplinary uh, disciplinary context, sound has a big potential to open up new ways of knowledge and imagination in education. And not only in academia, uh, we aim to work with different communities and especially with local governments in order to include sound into decision-making processes. Um, secondly, we strongly believe that sonic learning is crucial for all disciplines, next to architecture and urban design departments. In that way, it does not belong only to acoustic design or music theory or practice. Therefore, we believe sound can be used as a transdisciplinary research tool. We narrate the architecture of the built environments in our research from the perspective of sounds. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation with the terminology, our architecture, and we see uh, at the same time sound as artistic research tool as well. Working with sound requires um, understanding the emotional, behavioral uh, experiences of the space. In such artistic research, sound uh, creates possibilities to perceive our surrounding through, through senses. From an uh, audible um, perspective, we can observe the qualities of things beyond the dimension of the visible. Uh, as in works, Oliveros or Refebre, our body is the tool that helps us uh, to understand the environment and our practice and projects can be seen as examples of sensory aural training. So uh, those are the points which you can take uh, as some proposals to include sound in different uh, design processes. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the talk and our arguments uh, were clear enough. Uh, it is extremely uh, difficult to talk about hearing and listening as each individual has its own perception. Uh, hopefully you, you got something from this talk. So we would like to, to thank you for hearing and listening to us. We are open to any questions, please ask. And also in the future if you have if you have any questions or inquiries you can write us an email and thank you again for the curatorial team for the invitation and we hope that we can go to lithuania soon and do the rhythm encounter workshop there how yeah. we planned hopefully so we stop share now mm -hmm. Did you get our emails? Yeah. What time is it? I think we are good on time. Shall we turn off the camera or we are good? Uh, okay, so yeah, you are good. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for the presentation. And uh, I just wanted um, to ask you, uh, like how one, like what would be the beginning or how one starts to develop or let's say improve his, uh, sensor like sonic imagination or uh sonic perception uh like you, after like the stock for example well what uh, is the starting point it's it's uh, super easy just go out and listen no. <laughs> just <laughs> No, but I think it's like different always for, for different people. No, always the starting point is depends of the background of the receiver and how wanted to implement in their own practice. And, and this is what we find it quite rich in our uh, format of working in the workshop. We never know uh, the participants, so we can expect in, in how they are going to receive uh, what we're trying to negotiate or we're trying to to dialogue with them and I find like in the end it's like someone always brings something and just making you thinking that you should listen in differently or change your mode of attention already helps to to do a change in mm. something so yeah I cannot say how to start, but I think everyone knows how to change that perception or mm. how to use it. I guess it's uh, it's definitely important where 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 you're coming from, and also which which country, which city you are, because um, sonically every every city 
um, every country is tot uh, works uh, or functions totally differently. But if you really want an, an exercise that it's definitely um, doing, for example, um, or asking a help of friends uh, that walk with you that while your eyes are closed, so that your attention is on your ears and in listening. So that maybe it's a good start, and then uh, also not think not only not only as a as a as a signal as we said in the beginning, but like making these connections of of like the cultural, social, and and political connections of that sounds that we uh, we are hearing. Yeah. Um, thank you, and uh, uh, you both live and work in Berlin. And could you tell from your professional and personal experiences, uh, what do you find the most attractive in the sonicscapes of Berlin? And where do you see the maybe areas for improvement and the areas that or, or sonic aspects of the city that uh, you find disturbing? Okay, so I guess I should respond that as my my uh, my research is also my case studies in, in Berlin. Uh, it's again going to be really personal, but I guess for me uh, the the most interesting sound is definitely the the, the sound of nightlife, um, because it's very diverse and very alive, or it was and we don't know what's gonna happen, but at least it was like that. And I guess Berlin uh, Berlin is like, uh, Berlin is quite quite city. Like it's, it's, not, it's not a noisy city. It just um, depends like how your personal being, uh, if you are really stressed and like, uh, and you, you put yourself in the stress and like moving with this rhythms and then could be really, um, really uh, noisy maybe, but um, other than that, it's not, um, I mean, mostly in Europe, right? It's, it's not like really noisy uh, environment. And also, I guess it creates the surprise places, Berlin, because of the construction, because of the architecture. There are, um, there are for example, courtyards. Right now, for example, we are in a courtyard that even the, the, the street is super um, busy, we don't hear anything. Uh, we, we not really realize if there's life outside. So the, the closed architecture that it comes from this, uh, uh, um, the, like the, 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 from the architecture and the construction, um, I guess makes kind of different Berlin. But this is really interesting question, Derek. Uh, we, part of our seminar at the university, is reflecting of this kind of question because at the end you how far you are listening you know when you are describing sound of the city uh, like Banu say describing a, a environment when it's home but related with a courtyard that is kind of blocking the sound of the traffic of the street and there are this project that we really like it from the artist Peter Kusak we invited already twice in our seminar he's doing this uh, favorite sound projects interviewing uh, people about their favorite sounds and the relation with them. And when he was presenting this project in our course and asking our students, what is your favorite song in, in Berlin? It's really rich to see all the different approaches of the answers. No, they are like, it's like a, a scale. You can zoom in, zoom out of the notion of listening. And this complexity carry a lot of information and I find really interesting question and it's really difficult to actually mm -hmm. to answer. Mm -hmm. so, like we were, are you miss really personal as well? Yeah, he was doing also this project in different cities, uh, like especially in Berlin, it's called favorite, uh, favorite sounds, uh, Berlin favorite places. This is the book. This is the book. Uh, and he realized that actually in different countries and different contexts, and one of the most common responses is the, the, the public transportation, for example, everybody's um, favorite sound. And it's Berlin. also in Berlin also, in London, in, in China, everywhere. So. Mm -hmm. You are mute. 
Thank okay. you. Uh, yeah, and the uh, last uh, question, in, for example, uh, if you go to Kona's um, train station inside, you will hear uh, classic music playing. Also, there was a proposal to start playing uh, classic music as well in the trolleys as a kind of means to soothe the uh, sonic environment okay, and to help uh, uh, people to relax during their journey. And there were like uh, also other examples where some of the sonic interventions were considered by the municipalities as a sort of uh, sonic design or audio design. Uh, how do you feel about such a mm, bold and straightforward uh, uh, sound design and such uh, interventions usually for like very practical uh, uh, purposes uh, in public spaces or public transportation? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, this is what you gave an example. It's a, it's a positive example because in Germany uh, they use classical music in the big um, uh, or the main train stations to, uh, to um, get rid of the homeless people. So uh, this is like a big uh, discussion in Germany, in different cities like Bonn, uh, I guess in, in, in Hamburg it started first. And then especially um, they last year or two years ago, they wanted to do in Berlin. So that if the idea is like, if we play classical music, the homeless people, they're not gonna, um, they're not gonna stay in that area. So that it's kind of a cleaning tool. Uh, in that sense, you can you can understand the, also the danger of sound, uh, and which sound is like extensively used uh, in uh, in in war situations, uh, and now is like uh, for example, Germany is one of the um, uh, leading um, country that creates the long range. Um, um, LRD, uh, the, the sound device, which uh, has been used in the Ferguson uh, movements, for example, in the US, as, as um, towards the or against the, the protesters. It's like really uh, high frequency sound, and you uh, that you cannot stay there, so you just uh, you just um, you just go away. Uh, so that is there are two sides of of interventions with sound can be uh, can be yes can create this relaxedness like as all of the shopping malls for example were ex like practicing or like trying out or like um or also like the sound art installations one of them that we showed uh, there are also like more uh, mechanical ones that they work with the, for example with the um with the wind and so on uh, can create like more natural sounds and so on, but at the same time, it can be really used by uh, by um, different uh, against the different problems and uh, can become a weapon at the end. Right? Mm -hmm. This is like really a yes, very interesting question that approaching with the history of music with Musak, like this background music, have always approached it. And to be aware of that, I think this uh, engaged the political dimension of how sound can be used and should not be used. It's the same that uh, sometimes I, we call it like this kind of sonic perfumes. Not you can add a sound of birds to reinforce uh, the, the feeling of nature in a park or this kind of, uh, so. Sometimes uh, the intervention with sounds, of course, could be more precise or less precise of a failure or reaching the point to, to, to be aggressive for, for, for the inhabitants. You know? and, but it's interesting like, to be aware, like not only listening and hearing, like to be aware what we are listening and how we are listening and what we want to listen and what we want to block. Mm -hmm. That is it's in the end. Yeah. Uh, question that we want to bring in our mm -hmm. workshops and mm -hmm. not only sensing like receiving the vibrational form like a positive uh, we like as human can perceive the environment hourly now as where well, we should be aware of what's this uh, information these sounds are carrying and, mm. and also like um, I was going to say something but <laughs> it's come so 
I guess we are in that sense a bit radical uh, because um, um, it's it's a reality check. No, we are living in cities. You decided to living in city, and there will be noise. So what we are trying to do with our practice is like trying to understand of level of uh, human perception, so that it's differ differs from each person to each person. Uh, for us, is like if you decide to live in the city, so there is um, there is really uh, small ways to make this noise not happening. And maybe with the technology in the in the future, but right now we have to learn to live with the sound, and we have to create our own strategies to 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 fight against it if really bothers us. So. Um, I guess in that sense, like our projects are really, uh, really helpful to 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 combine this human perception and and what's 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 in the in the city in the in the sound environment. Mm, thank you. I really like the uh, concept of sonic perfume, and <laughs> also our attempt to really cleanse the environment, kind of leave no traces of the space that we live in. And I see like there's uh, one more last question from the audience and Pepe Sanchez Molero asks, uh, would you consider it architectural practices nowadays too much focused on visual sense and how could sound influence architectural urban design? Um, Pepe, thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I guess not. Uh, only currently, I guess architecture and urban design uh, is mostly focused on on the visual aspect, and we um, we kind of uh, sometimes forget about the the other senses, and um, and I guess this two um, the methods that we propose um, can be really helpful for for the practitioners. To include the, the sound, and we are only working on sound. Of course, there are other senses that that can that can be added, like uh, like smell, for example. So um, there are definitely like more progressive projects in in architecture, also in urban design. But in all, like in the percentage, I guess it's not really seen or or like um, appreciated. Uh, because um, it's it's definitely a visual uh, visual profession. And this is what we wanted to approach in the beginning. I, I really like to thank you, Pepe, for for us again. No, that is like how Johanny Palasma in the book uh, uh, Architecture of the Senses he criticized how architecture was dominated for visual senses and how architecture can be rethink as well through the other senses that uh, is, is like the touching, the, the hearing, the, um, the smell. So like uh, all together, this multisensory approach of how we perceive the space is really important in in not only, of course, always visual is like the more dominant uh, sense that we have, but uh, we should be aware like an architect and designers that what we design is as well have this our dimension and we have to thinking about like really concrete uh, projects. You can go to a really nice restaurant really elegant maybe and uh, the acoustic dimension or the acoustical space is horrible you cannot talk with the person in front or you go to work in an office eight hours per day and it's dramatically like a nightmare to be there for the noise that is generating all these spaces so we like an arch architects thinking from the inside to the outside we are creating these power dimensions and either that we can approach it, we should be aware how to improve it or how to create something different. No? So there are many architects that we are referring, Bernhard Leitner, and for example, I, this approaching sound technology and architecture and the conceiving space. 
But of course, like always, it's really difficult the dimension of our architecture. And, and I think like this is our point to just to, to be aware of what we can reach thinking out of this. Mm -hmm. I hope we answer. Yeah, and also and also in the in the parts in the context of participation, right? Like um how to include the senses, like maybe writing, maybe words doesn't really enough to 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 describe what what you're feeling about that place, about that especially in the urban area. <clears throat> and um we have to think other senses we have to apply because also for example sound can create a long space give give that um feeling of um claustrophobic sometimes sometimes more open sometimes uh, more stressed uh, as we give some examples so uh, that's um that does, there is there is definitely a, a oral architecture and the, the sound definitely produces uh, produces spaces and when we talk about architecture uh, we talk some in this scale of architecture urban scale no we are always like using both words like to talk about the spatial design practice and we think like in our experience like doing this with me encounter these urban games that we were explaining before we we did in different contexts and for example we were one time really specific working with students and professional for urban design and for us, this is like quite interesting when someone say, yeah, I'm working in design cities and just maybe I realized that I never was really paying attention to listen to spaces. And this is for us like really interesting when we have like this kind of question, someone questioning himself, he was listening before, either was conceiving a space, public spaces or urban design for many years. So mm -hmm. it's like this kind of a small touch to get uh, close to the oral dimension and not only in architecture like this is jumping mm. from urban scale to architecture to interior design to another practices like mm. arts or education yeah we hope we hope to to go further and and uh, reach the the municipalities and local governments at one point mayors book us <laughs> Oops. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Samuel and Banu. And this talk concludes the series Regeneration and is Discontent. And I'm uh, very grateful for everyone who came uh, in person and online. And uh, hopefully you found something that was interesting for you, something that revealed the parts of uh, different parts of the urban transformations. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's about all in the series and we will have a publication later on. So follow the Architecture Fund and see you in the other events. Bye. Thank you. Bye.